morning, everyone. Grab your hymn books. Let's all stand. We'll sing Wonderful Grace of Jesus, hymn number 210. Let's all stand and sing. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Baptist Church. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin our services today. I just want to, first of all, thank you for being here, and uh, it's been a great week. Let's pray. And uh, uh, Brother Daniel, if you would, sir, would you please lead us in prayer? Father, we thank thee for thy grace and for thy mercy that can transform a sinner into thy child. Father, we do ask that thou continue to work in the hearts of these young people that were coming to this vacation Bible school this past week. Allow them to remember what they've learned, what they've studied, and we do ask that the Holy Spirit would work in their hearts and convict them of their need of salvation so they can take part of thy grace. Father, we do ask you to bless the preacher this morning. Allow thy word to go forth so we can be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Please be seated. So good to be here this morning. It's been a great week, and I want to, first of all, thank 
everyone that participated with Vacation Bible School uh, this past week, and it was just such a blessing to see so many folks out uh, throughout the week, and some of, some of you are out every night helping out with all kinds of things, and, and you know, we finished up uh, yesterday, right, we had lunch, and then the uh, kids go outside for games. I was uh, mentioning to, um, uh, to Brother Jeremy this morning, uh, after we finish up, you know, of course, we have to take some things down so we can actually meet in the auditorium, and I didn't get a chance to really see a lot of the activities, because Brother Jeremy uh, covert takes care of that, but I did get to see a few pictures. And, and you're, if you had kids here yesterday, they came home probably soaking wet, and uh, which is good. It was a nice warm day, and so I saw a lot of uh, squirt guns out there. And Dave running around with a hose. I think he was supposed to be filling the squirt guns with water, but I, he, I think he missed a few times. And so kids were getting soaked, and I saw a bucket, a picture of a bucket of water. Um, getting poured over top of Brother Jeremy. And so the, I, I think Isla, if I'm not mistaken, you were supposed to pick up like dead balloon parts and you picked up the most. So what, what, what was the reward for picking up the most balloon parts? Oh yeah, you got to dump a bucket of water on Mr. Jeremy's head. What a great blessing that is. And so it was mutually beneficial, was it not, my brother? It was, you didn't have to pick up a single one of them, amen. It got cooled down afterwards, too. Uh, we had a great time. It was a wonderful uh, VBS. And, and um, of course, we had the penny offering. Um, and uh, that's the results of the penny offering up there. 1,064 pounds of pennies. I wrote Brother Hall yesterday afternoon to let him know that we're, we're sending a, over, we're sending a, a little over a half a ton of pennies his way. Uh, he commented he's going to have to do something about a suitcase issue now going to Thailand. But um, we do the math. It's a, uh, uh, we use the formula $1.81 per pound. Um, that's even cheaper than ground beef, isn't it? I'm not sure, but $1.81 per pound. And uh, so if you do the math, it's, uh, a, a nine, uh, I think it was $1,925.84. And so uh, almost $2,000 came in uh, this past week just in our penny offering. Uh, we almost broke the front pew by storing it all there uh, after the penny offering. But uh, it was a great blessing. Thank you. I, I mentioned in Sunday school, I know, it's, I know it's not just the kids rummaging through the furniture at home finding change. Uh, moms and dads and all of you have a lot to do with that. And thank you so much for your generosity towards the penny offering. And I'm trying to remember who won this year. Who was it? It was the uh, who? Oh, they don't seem very excited about that. Who, who won this year? The girls won this year. And so uh, it was a big comeback on that, la on that last day. And of course, the boys won the first two. The girls won on, uh, on Thursday. The boys won on Friday. And uh, they seemed to be well ahead. It was, they, were, it was, they were just, and all of a sudden, we just had this strange event. That took multiple waves of pennies that came in uh, on, on Saturday, and the, and the girls just pulled way ahead. It was over 300 pounds just on the girls' side uh, that came in on, on, on Saturday. But everything that comes in, of course, goes to our missionary. Uh, the halls, of course, are in Thailand, are going back to Thailand. They're here in the States right now. And I mentioned to the boys and girls, I said, one of the ministries that the halls do, um, in order to be in Thailand, you don't, you're not necessarily there as a, you know, it's not necessarily a missionary type of visa to be in Thailand. And so usually missionaries are in Thailand have to have some kind of activity which benefits the Thai people. And what the, the halls do is they teach English uh, to, uh, to Thai folks. They have an English school and that gives them their permission to be in the country and gives them opportunities to minister. Boys and girls, uh, one of the things that they're involved in, I mentioned this Saturday, is they teach English to kids your age. And in doing so, they're using bi the Bible, they're using Bible lessons. And so the young folks are hearing the scriptures uh, being taught to them as they're learning English. And of course, in, in so doing, they're learning about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with all these pennies that you've sent in, you are helping young folks your own age in the country of Thailand to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to thank you for doing that. So tonight, 
uh, come back for our evening service this evening. It's the last Sunday of the month. We always celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, do a lot of extra singing. I want to talk a little bit more about VBS tonight um, uh, during our evening service. Maybe some testimonies. If you have a testimony you'd like to share about VBS, save that for tonight. Uh, we're going to sing a little bit of the songs. I'm going to ask our song leader, Mr. Tom, uh, to sing some of those songs tonight. If you want to get the big screen up and running, that's up to you. Or you can, we all have them memorized by now, but I'll leave that up to you, Tom. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about our VBS tonight. Um, the decorations uh, will probably be up this week, and we have some folks that slowly take them down. Uh, but I do appreciate uh, all the hard work that went into making sure that everything was just spot on. If you weren't here uh, this past week, and some of the decorations are still up even downstairs, uh, the one classroom that's right below us here was, was Mary's house. And uh, uh, Sister Donna Street, she, she plays a really good Mary. You did a great job. And, and Christian Joy, you were Mary's um, next door neighbor. And what's, what's her name? Eunice, okay? And um, so um, boys and girls uh, every night would go down to Mary's house. They would hear a, a different Bible lesson down there each night. And, of course, other activities, memor uh, Bible memorization, things like that. And, of course, just a lot went on. They come up here for the closing uh, uh, session with the big blue box, and that's always a lot of fun. But um, our goal, of course, uh, year after year with our Vacation Bible School is to make sure that young folks have an opportunity of hearing the Word of God. It's not just entertainment. It's not just fill them with you know, candy and send them home. Uh, we make sure that they hear the Word of God, they hear the Scriptures, they're reminded of the truth of the Word of God, and they're introduced to Jesus Christ. And I hope that we've done that this year. And if we have, and the Lord is, is pleased, I just want to say that you had everything to do with that. And thank you so much. Uh, other than that, as far as announcements go, the, this week on Thursday is the 4th of July, so we will not be meeting Thursday night. We'll be meeting on Wednesday. So come out Wednesday evening. Uh, for our prayer meeting and Bible study, regular time at 7 o'clock, and then, of course, back on schedule come next week, and uh, it'll, it'll just be a great blessing. So, uh, again, thank you for being here. Uh, we have our memory verse, and uh, it was good to have the, the rabbi visit us this past week also. Amen. That's always a blessing. So, uh, Brother Stephen, come on up. Let's do our memory verse, and then We'll be putting the change bucket out. I don't know if there's any change left. It I think we've depleted everything, but we'll put the change bucket out for the boys and girls. All right, so Brother Stephen, if you would, please. Okay, yes. One last time, we'll turn to Psalm 86. If you turn there with me, we've been working on verses 8 to 10 together as a church. So while everybody's turning there, I need a pin runner. Mr. Hunter, be the official pin runner for today. Thank you, sir. And congratulations, Mr. Hunter, for your victory in the uh, Carpenters uh, competition. Yes. Yes. The Yeah. Are you <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. So, Psalm 86, verses 8 to 10. If you're there, if you could read that along with me nice and loud, it says, Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Okay. Anybody left still working on that, wants to give that a shot today, feel free. Any takers? I haven't gone yet, Hunter. Among the gods, there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Amen. Amen. There it is. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anybody left, I bought you some time to cram. Anybody else? No, that's all right. You guys did good on that one. Thank you, Hunter. Tom? Okay, put the change bucket out. Grab your hymn books, hymn number 244, Amazing Grace. Let's all stand and sing. 244, Amazing Grace.
Girls, if you're in junior church, you can head on downstairs. We'll see you guys and gals later. I do want to invite you this morning. Take your Bibles and join me over in 
John chapter 1. John chapter 1 this morning. We'll get back to um, our series in Philippians in a little bit, but I just could not resist this portion of Scripture this morning, say that I'm standing in the city of Nazareth. And um, I was just asking Tom, I said, what, what uh, does that say up there? So if you've got like Google Translate or Lens or whatever you got, if you want to, if anybody can get a picture of that and translate that for me, I'd appreciate it. Can you see it from there? Because I know the one out in the foyer, which was the bakery, translated perfectly. Google Translate did that really well. I know this is Beth, that's house, and I'm thinking house of prayer. What is it? That's the, that's the term, that's synagogue? Does Google say, if Google says so, it's got to be right. Okay, amen. And so uh, I'm, this, I'm standing now in the synagogue. This was, uh, 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 we had skits going on and we had folks coming out of here and uh, that this was a bakery for one day. Uh, uh, you, Brother Dennis, you, you were the baker, weren't you? Who, who was the baker? Yeah, sure. Oh, you were the baker. You were the one throwing rolls at uh, Brother Denny. Okay, yeah. This, this car, oh, I'm sorry. You're the carpenter. Carlos was, okay, he, he, somebody was throwing stale bread at uh, Brother Carlos. That was, that was excellent. And, uh, yeah, and, and, of course, then we had you know, the other skits there. We had uh, Mary, and, and um, uh, there was so, oh, just so much going on. And then the rabbi, that was a treat, brother. I, did, I wasn't expecting that. And we had the, the same rabbi we had last year visiting with us came back, and we, we sang a song, and it was just so much fun. Um, anyway, I figured I'm going to be in the city of Nazareth. I, I want to I preach this morning from a portion of scripture that speaks about that very thing. And so I would direct your attention, please, to uh, John chapter 1. I'm going to start in, start in verse number 43. Would you stand, please, for the reading of God's word this morning? This is John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1, beginning at verse number 43. Um, the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee, he findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip findeth Nathanael, um, and saith unto him, let me just mention that Nathaniel is mentioned here by name, Nathaniel. Uh, it is believed that this, as you see in the other Gospels, you kind of have to do the math and, and see all the, uh, all the apostles' names. It is believed that Nathaniel that's here is Bartholomew that's mentioned in the other Gospels. Do, I do want to remind you some of the apostles have different names in different Gospels. That's not an error or anything. I mean, Simon Peter uh, had several names that you'll see throughout the scriptures. That's not uncommon. Uh, but we see that Nathanael is mentioned here. He, the Bible says that Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael saith unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you, Lord. It's been such a wonderful week with Vacation Bible School, but it's such a blessing to be able to be here on this Lord's Day to open up your word and to find truth that's in it, truth that helps us, truth that ministers to us, truth that transforms us. And I pray, Lord, that you would do a work here today as your word goes forth. I'm thankful, Father, for all that took place this week, for all the lessons that were taught and all the activities that, that transpired um, and the truth that was given to all these young people throughout the week. And Lord, we look to you to change people's lives. And even the children who are a part of our ministry, we look to you, dear Father, to get, their, to get the attention of these young lives and to transform them into the children of God through the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And Father, here we are before you today, opening up your word and asking you to do wondrous things in our lives. Father, thank you for your precious word. I pray, dear Father, that we would come to know Jesus Christ as we should, for those that are without Christ, that they would be saved this day. For us, your children, Lord, that we would uh, learn to appreciate more and more that there is something that's good that came out of Nazareth. Now, Father, teach and direct us today. Receive glory, dear Father, as we respond to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Please be seated. 
Uh, what a great truth that's found here in reference to the city of Nazareth. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, then uh, at a young age taken down to Egypt and eventually uh, making his way back to the hometown of Mary and Joseph, and that is Nazareth in, in, the, in the region of Galilee. And, and so Jesus, of course, grew up there. Our vacation Bible school this year centered around Jesus as a child. And, and, um, and of course, mostly just the background information and the, and the lives uh, that were affected by him. And so, um, you know, when we, when we see the, the term Nazareth this year, we're actually talking about a city and a city there in, in the, the, the region of Galilee. Um, Christ's ministry is going to start in Capernaum, and it's, you know, a city that's uh, there um, along the coastal. It's a coastal city of the, of the Sea of, uh, of Galilee, and so a little, bit, uh, a little bit away from his hometown. But he began there, and he preached there. He was in the synagogues there, hence the synagogue right here. And we have this opportunity being introduced to him as, as Jesus of Nazareth. And this morning, we're talking about this, this event that takes place, and, and that, of course, that statement that's made there, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And I want to I talk about this calling that takes place. And that's what this section of scripture is. And we're introduced to Philip, and he's going to be one of the apostles. And we're introduced to Nathaniel, of course, as I mentioned, um, that um, likely that is Bartholomew that's mentioned in the other Gospels. Philip and Bartholomew, they're often mentioned together. And we see this calling that takes place. I, I want to remind you, first of all, that God's calling starts by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ has this desire. He came down to this earth to seek and to save that which was lost. That, that's a calling. And so this is a calling for the ministry, and I know that. And so I don't want to confuse the two, but I do want to say that when God desires for something to take place, He takes the initial step. He always does. You know, we love Him because He first loved us. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. It is always the work of God reaching down to mankind. You know, most religion is built on mankind trying to reach up to God. But true faith is rest, it rests on this truth that God desires to reach down to us. He is the one who always begins this inquest. He is the one who always begins the outreach. He is the one that always starts to work in people's lives through His Holy Spirit. Certainly, we have a responsibility. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But I want to, as we start this, I want to say, you're here today because God reached out to you. He's the one who brought this conviction upon your life. Certainly, someone gave you the gospel, and I know that. We're not saved apart from hearing the word of God. But, but God is the one who began that work in your life, that conviction the work of His Holy Spirit to reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. It is always a work of God. Here in the Gospel of John, we even see as we just take a few ste steps over into John chapter 4, you see the Lord Jesus Christ who must needs go through Samaria. And what happens there? He interacts with a woman at the well. And who takes the first step? Oh, Christ does. Give me something to drink. He just starts a conversation. But that conversation, of course, leads to him revealing to this woman that he was the Messiah. And, and all of a sudden, there's this tremendous burden that's been in her heart. All that just begins to come right out. Why? Because Jesus took the first step. It is always that way. Anything that we're able to do as a ministry... And we have a lot of responsibilities, but anything that we're able to do as a ministry is only coming along on the heels of what Christ is already doing. And it's um, a friend of mine, missionary, you know him, Doug Hammett. I remember him and I having a conversation one day, and he says, you know, his, his, this was his, this was his um, uh, attempt of describing his methodology. He summed it up in a very simple statement. He says, he just, he, what he said was this, just figure out where God is doing something and then show up there. And I just love that. It's, just, it's so simplistic because it's, it's, a, it's a dependence upon the fact that God is already at work. It's a dependence upon the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has a plan. 
And, and we just have to figure out what that plan is. It doesn't have to be complicated. But we just have to go where God is already at work. And believe this or not, God is already at work in the lives of people that you know. And all you have to do is just start the conversation that God has already began to burden them with. And so this whole event here begins with God dealing with uh, this man, Philip. He's going to, this again, it's a calling to the ministry. I know that. This is not a salvation uh, portion of Scripture. It has to do with his calling into the ministry. Uh, but we see who initiates it, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is always the initiator. And Christ goes forth. He's going to, he finds this man, Philip. He says unto him, follow me. It's a very simple thing. You see that repeated with um, the account of all the apostles that are, re- that are listed in the Bible as far as their calling goes. And he, he does it for, for um, uh, John and, and um, 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 we see with Peter and Andrew and James and John and we see uh, Matthew or Levi. He's also called Levi in the other scriptures. And, and so we see the same uh, calling repeated. But you please remember, these guys didn't just go uh, you know, uh, up to Jesus and say, hey, listen, we want to be apostles and where do we sign up at? Um, I do want to remind you, most of these guys were all part of John's uh, discipleship and John, John the, of course, John the Baptist, he's been ministering and preaching and these folks are, are being a part of that. But Christ is the one who said, follow me, follow me, follow me. And particularly, we talked about Peter a couple weeks ago, particularly with Peter. Boy, Peter had a hard time with that one. And there are multiple occasions where we see recorded in the scriptures of, of, of John, of, excuse me, of, of Peter being approached by the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, follow me, Peter. And it took him a while to catch you on, but he finally did. Um, so the Lord Jesus Christ does not let up when it comes to his callings. And I, I want to present that to you this morning in reference to a calling as far as serving the Lord. God uh, has a place for all of us to serve and has a desire of getting us engaged in the ministry in, in, in some way or another. Um, and he's not going to let up until that takes place. But I do want to remind you also when it comes to salvation, um, God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has been extremely patient with so many wanting them to hear the gospel and to respond to it. And it may be that you've heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ on many occasions, and God is still patiently waiting for you to respond to that. God is the one who starts the calling. The calling started with Jesus. But please notice in our text here, we're in John chapter 1, verse number 43. As I read that, of course, he's talking to Philip. He says to follow me. Verse number 44, it says, now Philip was from Bethsaida. We're just getting some, uh, some geography here. Uh, Bethsaida is, uh, you know, Sea of Galilee. Uh, um, Capernaum is up top there. Um, and uh, Bethsaida is kind of around the corner a little bit. It's still a, uh, on the Sea of Galilee, and it's that, that general area. Um, and so, um, but we're talking about working around the Sea of Galilee. Um, and, he, and, he, and this is what the Bible says in, in verse number 45. And Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him. The calling, of course, that's initiated by the Lord Jesus Christ, this calling then has to be, it's, it, it started with Christ, but then it has to be spread from people to people. He says to him, please notice what it, what it says here. At the end of of verse number 46, he said, come and see. Come and see. This is a calling. I made reference just a little bit ago to the woman at the well. It's from John chapter 4. Jesus goes and speaks to the woman at the well and, and has that conversation. It begins with a conversation about water, and then he says, I've got living water, and and that whole thing, I perceive that thou art a prophet, and we, we have this conversation about her sinful past. There's nothing better than talking about someone's sin in order to build a relationship, you know. But that's exactly what she needed to hear. She needed to be confronted about her sin. Let me just say, no one is saved 
by the grace of God until they're first of all willing to admit their sinfulness and their hopelessness in that sin. And that must be confessed before a holy God. And so God is revealing to her, just bring this conversation up. And, and she catches on. This guy, he's a prophet. They have this conversation about prayer. That's the, that's the question that she has, you know. You all down, you Jewish folks, you pray down here, and uh, we, we Samaritans, we pray in this mountain, and he, he begins to talk to her about what true worship is, spirit and truth, and then he, be, and then he says, he reveals, this is the first person that he actually says, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ. Wow. It's, it's the longest conversation recorded in the scripture with someone. And it's with this woman at the well in Samaria. It's beautiful. And then what does she do? She leaves her bucket. She heads to town. And she says, come see a man that told me whatsoever things I've done. Isn't he the Messiah? Come see a man. You see, this calling that started by the Lord Jesus Christ has to then be spread by others. This is what happens here in the text that we're in in John chapter 1, and we see Philip being dealt with by the Lord Jesus Christ, and what's the first thing he wants to do? Is he going to follow Christ? Certainly. But what does he want to do? He wants to go and spread that good news. I don't know what the relationship is between, uh, bet- between Philip and Nathaniel. I just know that their names, if it's Bartholomew, and I believe it is, their names are always right next to each other in all these lists of apostles. I don't know what their background was. It, it, we, knew, we know things like, for instance, James and John were brothers, and Peter and Andrew were brothers. We know those guys were in a, kind of a fishing thing together. So we, we get some of this interconnection of some of the apostles. But with these two guys, I don't know what the connection is. But he's the first person that comes to this man's mind after he meets Jesus Christ. Think about that. Is there somebody that comes to your mind when you think about your relationship to Jesus Christ? Come see a man. This spreading of the gospel is an, is an essential part of the work of the, of, of the ministry. <clears throat> With, without it, I mean, what, what's this all about? Without this spreading of the gospel. You know, there's a lot of different ways that we do that, that we spread the gospel. And um, um, we, we're involved in evangelism, all kinds of different ways. So that we can go through neighborhoods and hand out literature and knock on doors. We can... You know, the, the, the day and age that we live in. And if you, if you would, you know, if you would have gone back, you know, uh, 40, 40 years and, uh, you know, folks are advertising on television and radio and newspaper. When we first moved here, um, we, we would advertise uh, in the newspapers. We were on the, the base had a newspaper. Um, Burlington County Times had a newspaper. We always run ads. All right, let me just ask. When's the last time you bought a newspaper? I don't think I bought a newspaper in 10, 15 years, okay? Um, because I just, I read online nowadays, okay? And uh, I, that's where I get all, all my news. Things change. Methodology, methodology, metho- I can't even say it. Methodologies change. There's all kinds of ways of reaching people. It used to be that TV and radio advertisements were the thing and newspapers were the thing and and there's a lot of different ways of reaching people. But the point of it is we've got to reach people. Because once Jesus has introduced himself to us, guess what we have the responsibility to do? To introduce others. That's, that's the responsibility that we have. And we cannot shirk that responsibility. The, you know, there is so many different ways and, and, and to do that. We see this. What we see here. 
in, in John chapter 1 is, again, calling to the ministry, but it's a personal invitation, okay? And again, if you, if you know someone and you say, well, I've just met the Lord Jesus Christ, who do I want to say, hey, I want you to come see a man? Well, you have the responsibility of making sure that individual gets to hear that invitation. We were in John, we were just making reference to John chapter 4 and the woman at the well. She goes to her city. And this is just not a one on one thing. I got a friend I want to introduce to Jesus. I can't, I don't know how this played through, but this woman comes from the well. He goes into the city and she's, I, I just get this picture of her. And again, I don't know how it played through, but she told the whole town. I don't know what did she get, she get like in the marketplace there. And get up on, on you know, a bale of hay. Think, do we have a bale? Well, there's still a bale of hay on the back porch there. We ought to just bring it in so I can stand on it, right? And then somebody had to vacuum up after the mess. But we, you'd stand there, and, and could you imagine her standing there going, Hey, everybody, can I get your attention, please? I just met this guy. <laughs> I don't know how it played through, but there's a whole bunch of folks from that town that went out to meet Jesus because this woman said, Come see a man that told me everything that I have ever done. Is he not the Messiah? And now they were curious. Her telling, her, her telling them about Jesus did not save them. They came to inquire themselves. They talked to him. They had the conversation. And they said, you know, we believe. Not because you said so, but we've seen it ourselves. The conversation that she had with Jesus gave her this boldness to share it with others, and they came and investigated, and they got to know Jesus too. That's how it works. And one of, the, one of the greatest things that you can do as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is to share the same calling that God placed in your life. You met Jesus, and you have a responsibility of making sure others have a, have a chance to do that. And like I said, there's a lot of different ways to do it, uh, but, you know, one of the most effective ways of evangelism is found in personal invitations. It is the most effective method of evangelism. And that is you inviting other people to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. T keep your place here and go with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation, ver uh, chapter number, chapter 22. And um, I'm, I'm reading verse number 17. Just one verse of scripture here that says this. The spirit and the bride say, come. All right. Now, so we could stop right there and say, well, this is a, it's like a, it's, it's like a God ministry, right? The Holy Spirit of God and the bride and, and you know, we're, that could, identi of course, identifying as the church, and we think about it as a kind of a corporate type of thing. But, you know, the, what, we, what we see here is this first statement that says the spirit and the bride say, come. All right, so we, we have a responsibility, of course, as a church to make sure that we do, uh, that, we, that we're involved in evangelism. But I, I want you to look at this as this continues, and let him that heareth say, come. All right, so you are the one that heareth. There was a ministry that reached out to you and said to you, come. And you, and you came, you heard the gospel, you got saved. And, and now what we have is this, is this progression now you're the one who heard, and what are you what are you gonna say? What are you gonna say? You, you're gonna you're gonna you, you heard this message. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And you responded to that. So what's your responsibility now? Your responsibility is to say, come. Is to take that same that same message and deliver it to others. This is, this is what was happening with Philip and then with Nathaniel. And Nathaniel is going to end up being one of the apostles. Uh, the word apostle has sent one. His ministry is going to be going out and, and inviting others 
to uh, meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, during the time of Christ, they were sent out on a, on a few occasions, but after Christ's ascension, uh, their ministry is going to explode in reference to their outreach. And so this is, this, this is what was going on there, and that same thing is talking about here in Revelation, this, this you know, passing along, this calling, and that same thing goes on here. You've got a responsibility. I want to remind you that we have opportunities here at New Testament Baptist Church to get involved in evangelism. And I was just, I was just talking to Brother Stephen just the other day. I sent him a text message. We were just talking the other day. The um, rest of the summer, uh, we are going to focus our attention on, as I described it, the river cities. And uh, several, several weeks, uh, this is, I don't know, going back several weeks ago, um, Stephen and I was talking about doing some some of the track attacks, and I'd ask them if we could just do something local. I think you were talking about those river cities back then. But, um, but um, you know, down the end of this road here, we have things like we have the, the towns of Florence and Roebling and, of course, uh, Fieldsboro's over there, Bordentown. The, our guys have spent a lot of time in Bordentown area. There's a lot of folks that live over there and, and worked up there for months and months and months, just handing out literature, knocking on doors and such. But we, this summer, I want to I wanna do those river towns. And so um, you're going to hear some things from Brother Stephen about some out, outreaches coming up and some track attacks and things like that over the, next, uh, over the, over the rest of the summer. And I want to remind you, be a part of that. And, and, so, and some of you, uh, you know, you bring your little kids out and they have a blast. They just have a great time. And, uh, you know, last time I was out with Brother Stephen, we did track attack. At the, he had, had uh, you know, Ava and Kaylee with, they have so much time. They have so much fun. And Brother George and I, we're barely getting up and down the steps. But these little kids, man, they, and they want to do it, you know. And so, you know, there's, there's opportunities. There's opportunities to meet people and talk to people and invite people. And, and that is part of the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is about receiving the call of God, and then turning around and saying, come. And uh, here in Revelation, it's just a highlight of that, and of course that continues to come, and um, this continual call to come. And, and, um, and, and it says, um, I'm just going to, I want to finish reading verse number 17 there, there in Revelation chapter 22, and it says, and, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life Freely. This is, of course, talking about a call uh, to salvation. And, uh, and I want to remind you that you play an active part of that. The call starts with Jesus. It is spread from people to people. Uh, back in our text here in John chapter 1, um, as Philip in, is having this dialogue with, um, with Nathaniel, Philip findeth Nathaniel, and reading verse number 45, John 1, 45, he saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses... Uh, in, the, in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so, you know, it, it is a call that's based on Scripture. I just want to remind you, and this is what Philip is, is rehearsing with Nathaniel. This is not just my opinion. This is what the Word of God says. Uh, we found him of whom Moses uh, in the law and the prophets did write. And, uh, you know, when we talk about um, a people's relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are, what we're doing is we are actually looking into the Word of God. I ask you please to turn with me to 1 first, uh, first Corinthians chapter 15. And I just want to remind you, and you're familiar with these portions, these, this passage of Scripture. And this, is, of course, is uh, where the gospel, uh, the gospel in and of itself is mentioned. Uh, on Thursday nights, we've been going through a series about the appearances of Jesus Christ. And that's, of course, mentioned here also. But please notice uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which ye also have received and wherein you stand, um, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. This is Paul talking, and he's talking to the church in Corinth. Now, I do want to remind you that Paul was a Jew. He was raised as a Jew. He was raised in synagogue. He was studied uh, as, a, as a Pharisee, and so he had a great religious background. He's writing to a church that is primarily a Gentile church. They did not have a New Testament that we have today. They had certainly the 
what we call the Old Testament and the Jewish scriptures. And so when Paul is making reference uh, to things according to scripture, he's talking about Old Testament text. But the point of it is, it's still God's word. And Paul is writing as a Jew to a group of Gentiles and reminding them of something. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You know, when we minister, we minister with the word of God. We minister to people and point them to Jesus Christ as he is found in the scriptures. It certainly is true that many churches have corrupted the gospel message, and have, have taken it away from the scriptural base. It, it amazes me sometimes when you hear about some of the things that some churches teach that are so far from the word of God. It's remarkable sometimes also that churches will um, kind of make it their rule that God is not done and that he's continuing to give revelation, it's very convenient when you do that, because if you say that God's not done with the scriptures, he's continuing to give revelation, you can, you can say anything you want and just say, oh, that's from God. And, and you end up with a gospel message which is far from what Paul was talking about according to the scriptures. We, we are not selling some line cunningly devised by men. We're actually, we're not even just promoting New Testament Baptist Church. You know, come and see what we got. We preach Christ and Him crucified. When we, when we go and we talk to people about their need for salvation, we're talking about um, their need based on the Scriptures. This is what the Bible says. This is what God says. And what you need is a faith that's not rooted in our doctrine or rooted in what we think or rooted in how we do our you know, activities here as independent Baptists. Um, your salvation needs to be rooted deeply in the scriptures and in the Son of God, which is Jesus Christ and Him only. There is only one way of salvation, and that way is through Jesus Christ, and we preach Him. It's a calling that started by Jesus Christ. It's shared by people to people, and it's based solely upon the scriptures, upon the word of God. And you have a responsibility. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you have a responsibility of knowing where your faith lies. You know, there's a lot of anxieties that comes along with evangelism, and I know that. You know, it's that same thing when you're standing there knocking on someone's door going, I hope no one's home, I hope no one's home. All right? Because it's easier just to put something on the door instead of talking to people. All right. I know that. Been there, done that. All right? There's, there is a lot of anxiety because you don't know. And, and people ask some questions sometimes and you just kind of scratch your head. I have no idea what they're even talking about. And, uh, I, you know, as a young Christian, I remember some of the early times that I had and I was at people's doors and they're talking about stuff that I had never even heard about. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, but, you know, I'll, I guess I'll have to talk to my pastor about it. I don't know, but, and, you know, you just kind of work your way through that. That's not the majority of the events. The majority of events are, are people um, that are just saying, hey, thanks for the, thanks for the information. And, uh, and then you just move on from there. But, you know, we, we, there are a lot of different things that we do here at the church. And, you know, some of it is, is you know, as simple as going through neighborhoods and hanging stuff on doors. And, and a lot, you meet a lot of people when you do that, which is wonderful. And, and so there's, there's a lot of ways to do this. But, um, but whether or not um, you feel comfortable talking to people, whether or not you're, you're going out and putting, you know, just literature, like what we call our track attack, putting literature on doors. But, but the, the, re the reality of it is, that no matter how you approach the work of evangelism, you still do need to understand what your faith is rooted in. 
that, that you do understand what salvation is about. You, you are able to, to describe it, explain it to other people. Uh, you may not have all the chapters and verses all memorized and, and ready to use it at an instant. But you know, if um, when you were saved, that was an event that took place in your life. You all have a testimony. And, um, you know, when, when something is dramatic as the birth of a child happens, um, you got a story that comes along with that. I remember when, when our first child was born, Buzz. I remember it so vividly. I was, I was working in Wilmington. I was uh, working at a, that drafting sweatshop that I often talked about. Um, we owned an old station wagon at that time. Okay, that was the minivan from the 70s and 80s, all right, old station wagons. And um, uh, Joyce, um, she was in, um, we had a couple false things that went on. We had been to the hospital a couple times already, and they like, you know, oh, she's not ready yet. I'm like, all right, uh, probably twice. Uh, so I'm, I'm at work, and um, I get a call. Um, Joyce is with her mom. She said, we're on the way to the hospital. This is pre-cell phone, okay? So I'm, you know, they're calling before they leave the house, and I'm at work, and I'm like, you're going, you're, you're, are, are, you, are you sure this time, you know? And uh, I'm like, I'll meet you there, you know, Wilmington General there. And, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm flying across town in an old station wagon, you know. And if you're familiar with those old stations, every time you hit a bump, it's like, woo. It was great. I, and I remember. And, and so, you know, I get to the hospital, and she's there. And, and uh, it, you know, she had just started the check-in process. Buzz was born January the 1st. He's a New Year's baby, okay? So she went into labor the day before. And so we're, we were there the entire day. Do you know how many people want to have their babies born on January 1st? It must, it's a thing, okay? The place was packed. There was pregnant ladies everywhere. They were stacked up in the hallways. Everybody wanted to have their baby on January the 1st. Be the first baby of the new year. And, you know... And, and she was in labor all day. Okay, I, I mean, I know all the details because it happened to me. I was there. I, she was in labor so long, I had to go get something to eat. I went across the street. There was a deli. I got a cheesesteak. I'm sitting there eating cheesesteak in, in the labor and delivery room. And my dear wife is going, will you put that away? I was there. And I got her hooked up to her monitor. I'm watching all these things. And I'm saying, hey, you're going to have a contraction. And she's like, shut up. <laughs> I, I was there. You know, so when you were born again, <laughs> it, you, have, you have a story to tell. It happened to you. Every detail of it. Everything that God burdened your heart about, all, 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 that, all, all that, um, that work of the Holy Spirit in reproving you of sin and righteousness and judgment, it all happened. You may not have all the memory verses down, but you got something that no one else has got. God called you out of darkness and translated you into his family, into his kingdom. And you got a story to tell. And, and so this, this work that took place here is, is, this, is this work that took this man. And of course, this, again, call the ministry, and I know that. But it changed everything about his life. His life was never going to be the same again after he met Jesus. And he, and he wants to drag his friend uh, Nathaniel along with him. Come, up, come, see this, come see this man. Now, I, we, we have to realize that if you, if you are back in our text there in 1 John, or excuse me, in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, you've you got to realize that, that not everybody is going to take it well. Um, here in our text, John chapter 1, and, and, he, and he, 
Philip's excited, right? This is it. We found them. This is Moses and the prophets. You know, this is Jesus. He's the, and so he is excited. And, and, what's, and what's Nathaniel do? Does this, this Nathaniel start jumping up and down going, oh, man, this is great. I can't wait to meet him. You see it? Come on, Philip. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, that's you're talking about wet blanket. He was not. He was not too excited. He wasn't excited as Philip was. Okay, and this is this is what happens often when you're excited about what's happening in your faith. It doesn't necessarily make everyone else around you excited about it. We all know that. You've experienced it in some way, shape, or form. Um, my family was not excited about my new faith. And, and I will say, even as God continued to work in my life, um, not everybody in my life was excited about what God was doing in my faith, with my faith. You know, God's dealing with you. He's, he's dealing right there in your heart, but that doesn't mean everybody else is getting the same folks. Sometimes it takes a little bit. Sometimes there are folks around us that are never going to get it. They, they are going to be suspicious. They are going to be critical. And, um, you, know, you know, Nathaniel's conversation about, you know, Nazareth is the fact that Nazareth was. It was kind of a, you know, backwood kind of town. You know, Jerusalem was the thing. Um, there are other cities uh, there in, in, in Israel, which are, you know, not necessarily major cities, but they're, you know, of renowned in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but, you know, Nazareth is a little podunk holler, if you would, kind of place. And um, that was just not on the radar. I mean, if, if there's going to be a Messiah, why in the world would he come out of Nazareth? That makes absolutely no sense. Philip was excited because he met Jesus, but Nathaniel was not because it made no sense to him. And I'm sure glad that the Lord Jesus Christ took the opportunity of dealing with him. You're going to have opportunities of ministering to people that are going to be critical of your faith. That's what's happening right here. Philip says, I'm all in. Nathaniel says, that's dumb. And you're going to have people that are going to be critical of your faith. Um, yet, for some way, shape, or form, uh, Philip made sure that Nathaniel had an opportunity of just meeting him. Just come on. Come on out to church. Just once. Just once. Just come out to church, will you? I am so glad <laughs> that my mother-in-law was persistent because when she first met Jesus Christ, she was excited. She told everybody. She had sisters that she told, invited all of her family out to church. Several of them got saved. Neighbors, things like that. She would invite Joyce and I. We had just recently been married. And I said, there is no way that I'm setting foot in that Baptist church ever. No thank you. Can anything good come out of a Baptist church? I don't think so. And I'm glad that my mother-in-law was persistent and said, come on out. Just come out to one of the services. And I went. And guess what? I met Jesus. And he changed my life. And Philip is here talking to Nathaniel. Just come, just come meet this guy. I, I know you're, you're not thrilled and yeah, I will agree, you know, Nazareth in the, <laughs> it's not Jerusalem, uh, but it's not, about, it's not about the town, is it? It's about Christ. And he went. I didn't read the rest of the story, but let me just, let's just peruse down here real quick as we wrap things up this, this morning. I stopped in verse number 46. It continues from there. He said, at the end of 46, it says, Philip saith unto him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming uh, to him and saith unto him, behold, an Israelite indeed, 
and who was no guile. And Nathaniel saith, and that, that got, his, it got his attention. That was kind of a weird greeting he got from Jesus. He'd never met him before, so it's not like, you know, he had any preconceived, you know, like this guy's a prophet type of thing that uh, he's going to, you know, gonna for, like fortune tell or anything. He, just, he didn't know what to expect, and that's uh, the first thing out of his mouth kind of got his attention. Um, G, uh, he says, whence knowest thou me? So all of a sudden, um, uh, Nathaniel's kind of, he, he, there's an interest there, but it's more of a curiosity. It's not a matter of, I want to find out what this prophet's all about. It's more of like, well, like what in the world's going on here? And then Jesus um, starts this conversation. He answered and said to him, before that Philip um, called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. We don't know the details. I don't know what happened. I've heard a lot of good sermons about this one. All of them speculation. But what, what we have here is Jesus saying, I know what's, I know what's going on in your life. You you remember with the woman at the well? Jesus says a very simple statement. Call your husband. Because he knew. He knew what was going on in her life. He knew about the sin issue. He knew about the divorces. He knew about the fact she was living with a fella. He knew. And he he just, he's like, call your husband. (laughs) So this is the same kind of, you know, button pushing moment here. Before Philip ever came and got you, you were underneath the fig tree. Now, it doesn't say what he was doing. Maybe. I'm, you can read the commentaries. There's a lot of, a lot of information that's just all speculation. But um, he's not dealing with sin issues here. He's, he's dealing with this calling. And I, I'm kind of wondering, is, was, was Nathaniel sitting underneath that fig tree, just praying, pouring out his heart to God. Lord, I, I know, I know you want to do a work. And I know, and you know, all the apostles had been, had been part of John's ministry, John the Baptist's ministry in some way, shape, or form, okay? And, and we see some of them very directly, and I know that, but all of them had the baptism of John. So that tells me that all of them, all the apostles, had heard John's preaching, and what's John preaching about? He's preaching about the fact that, he, that God's sending the Messiah. I'm preparing a way. He's, he's preaching about repentance of sin. And, and so Philip would have been under the preaching of John the Baptist. And that burden that John has been preaching about is now laid upon him. Was he underneath that fig tree just pouring out his heart to God? I don't know what you're doing in my life, but I, 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 wanna, I know you've got a plan for me. I know. Lord, what would you have me to do? And then Philip says, Hey, Nathaniel, you got a minute? And, and he's there in prayer, and he kind of pops his head up, and he says, What do you want, man? Can't you see I'm praying? He said, I want to introduce you to somebody. Jesus said, before Philip ever showed up, he said, I saw you there. And Philip knew exactly, exactly what he was talking about. He knew that when he was there, pouring out his heart to God, praying, however that played through, he, Nathaniel, he knew exactly that Jesus Christ knew what was going on in his life. He said, this is, this is what I need. You're, you're it. You're the Messiah. You're the King of Kings. And Jesus says to him, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> oh, my. You know, there are going to be people that are going to scrutinize your faith in Christ. But if you'll be persistent, God will get a hold of them. I, I just got to say, I'm, I can only speak for myself. I'm glad that somebody was persistent with me. Because God got a hold of me. And my life has, 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 has changed. 
because somebody got a call from God, took that same call and extended it out to someone else, was persistent with that even though I was skeptical. And then it changed my life. And God wants to do the same thing through you. He took that calling, he took that, that, that skepticism, and he turned it into something that was solid. It solidified that calling in Nathaniel's life, and it transformed his life. So that now, guess what happens? That whole thing, Jesus has been calling him, that whole thing now starts all over again. Where he's now spreading that call to others, where he is the one preaching the word of God, where he is the one dealing with those that are skeptical, but he's the one also that's building the solid foundation in other people's lives because he was willing to respond to God's calling. God is calling you today. As a, as a child of, if you're born again as a child of God, God is still calling you. We're not talking about salvation now, but we are talking about this, this engagement in the ministry, this involvement in the work of God, this reaching out to others as God has reached out to you. He is calling you to be involved in these same activities uh, that took place when you got saved. That, is, that will never end throughout your, the entirety of your Christian life. And as you respond to that, this, 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 it's, it, that circle just keeps going and going and going. But God is also calling to those that are laboring and are heavy laden. Your soul is heavy. You've been laboring to, to find peace in your life, to find eternal life. Lord, what must I do to be saved? That cry has come out from many souls because there's the burden in people's hearts, that weight of sin, that feeling of hopelessness and despair. And God, is called, if you're a thirst, come to me, come to me. God is always calling. And, and I present before you today the opportunity of, of responding to his call. My brother and sister in Christ, to respond to that call of being involved in the work of the ministry, an outreach of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, is there, is there anything that good that comes out of Columbus? Well, let's hope what good is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And we're the ones who are carrying it. Is there anything good to come out of New Testament Baptist Church? Let it be the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God is also calling, if you're here today, never been saved. No time in your life that you can look back and say, this is what happened to me. Born again, I would remind you that God is still in the business of saving the lost. And he is coming, he's calling to you, come unto me. You that are athirst, come. I'll give you the water of life. You can drink that freely. Come to me. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, Lord. It's good to spend some time in your house. It's good to open up your word. And Father, it is so good to see what Jesus Christ has done. And Father, to see what Christ is still doing today, to see the work that he's performing in the lives of so many. And Father, that you would have that desire to allowing us to be a part of the work that you've given. Lord, it started so many years ago with these men who were called to go and preach the gospel throughout all the world. And we've heard this gospel message even preached in our day and age today. It has not ended. And Lord, I just want to thank you that you've entrusted to us the responsibility of going into all the world and preaching the gospel to everyone. I pray, Father, that we would be about that business of reaching the lost with Christ. Now, Father, I do pray that you'd be merciful to those who never responded to your word and ask your Father to save the lost. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand, please.